good, Joel? Yep. All right. All righty. Let's welcome, do this. All right. Welcome to the podcast, and thanks for uh, coming to hang out with us today. We have uh, Dr. Kathy Forty. Uh, you have so many titles, I think, that could be applied to you that I, I and I feel like this is a thing that I end up doing a lot. Do you have like? Do you mean? Do you want me to do the try and list all the things you've done, or do you want to give it a shot? Oh no! Oh, no, I no. Sure no, that was like. Were... <laughs> no, no, I was. No, I'm I mean, to like, my friends, I'm just Kathy. But you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, when I go to parties, you know, I don't usually say too much until people say, "Well, what do you do?" <laughs> oh, and then it, then it's a lot, probably. I bet because you. And then they go, "Holy cow!" <laughs> <laughs> well, there's like there's a lot of them that are career worthy like i think i saw it was like clinical psychologist was like what the big one right like yeah, is, yeah is that, yes. uh, i got my alphabet soup after my name right <laughs> yeah an author right. of many books uh yes yes uh, an an inventor ex- inventor explorer explorer um yes what else would i tag on there what else uh, probably like a producer or would you say that like you had a YouTube uh, series for a little bit right like that, uh, and that wasn't stuff. no that wasn't youtube that was a web series web yeah series, that okay. was a while ago back yeah when i when i lived in california mm-hmm. i've been all over the place by the way and so right now i'm living in maui mm-hmm. where, where did you live before you you moved there like what's 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 home base for you well, I was born and raised in Chicago, Midwestern girl, and then I went to New York City and uh, went to undergraduate degree at, at uh, NYU and uh, got into the television industry, their television news industry, because I was a broadcast journalist uh, um, uh, degree to begin with. And then, you know, I kind of migrated to uh, Virginia Beach, became a therapist uh, you know, got my master's degree and then my doctorate degree. And then I went to LA and uh, Santa Monica. I had a practice there. And then, then it was really interesting. Right before COVID, I had a dream and I woke up. I, you know, after I had my near death experience, which I'll get into in a, in a bit. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I got a lot more psychic than I was before. And I woke up in the middle of the night and um, I heard as clear as could be in my head saying, Kathy, it's it's time to start preparing to leave California. And this was in um, this was an early uh, it was January of 2019. And I basically said, well, where am I going? And the voices said to me, Prescott, Arizona. And I'd never been to Prescott, uh, so I was doing an Egypt trip at the time, leading a group, and I said, well, when I get back, I'll go take a look at it, and I did, and I really kind of fell in love with it, and uh, wrote out the COVID years in Prescott, which was much easier because they weren't as crazy (laughs) there, you know, you had a lot more freedom, and uh, then uh, circumstances changed that uh, brought me to Maui. So I, it was kind of interesting. I, I, like I said, I wrote out the COVID years in Prescott, Arizona, and um, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a relief. It really was. I, I think my guides were kind of looking out for me, going like, "I think you may find California a little intolerable with some of the restrictions there. So we're gonna, we're gonna take you to a place that has less." restrictions and you'll be able to breathe more freely there and that's what happens so and i started because of covid i started writing books i mean i had already had a book out uh, i had a children's book many years ago spiritual children's book but then when i after i had my near-death experience i did write a book about it called fractals of god a psychologist's near-death experience and journeys into the mystical and uh, but that was you know really about my life and my experiences but then when covid hit you know, I I got into sci-fi writing and I I just loved it. So I've just finished the fourth book in the series. Uh it it's not available for print yet, Stacks Library of Truth. And and you know, it's sort of like we're getting into the, the thing, right? Well, we'll be backing into this interview kind of. Um and the thing is that there also it was a dream, middle of the night, a dream, and the whole I saw the whole plot. And I, I felt it was compelled to get up and start writing it. And I did. And I made it into a small little web series, you know, in California, nothing big. But then, you know, when COVID hit, I said, you know, 
there's a lot, this has got a lot of meat to this book. Let's put it, let's make it into a story. So it became Stacks Library Truth, Stacks Awakening Truth, Stacks Truth Will Set You Free. And, and the next, this one now is 20 years later, Stacks Next Generation Truth. So it was, it basically what happens was it was this young employee at the Library of Congress stumbles upon a, an interdimensional portal into a library of truth where all the truth is kept on everyone and everything since the beginning of time. I like that. And, uh, so he he discovers that, you know, there's some societies that have been manipulating this truth and using it against mankind, you know, and so he, it's his job to not get caught and to spill the beans, you might say, on the corruption and deceit and so forth, not only in the nation's capital, but all over the world. And this leads him down a really deep rabbit hole, finding out there's other interdimensional portals into other libraries around the world. And so, you know, it's uh, it, it was a fun book to write. And while I was writing, I felt like I was channeling it. I mean, there were things coming to me that I had no idea about. And I'm sitting there writing and I'm like, <laughs> part of me is going, oh, really? Oh, really? Is that so? You know, so um, it was uh, it it was the more it, it really got me into my true, true. Um, I, I never thought I'd be a sci fi writer, you know, and um, so you never know where you're going to land up in life. Well, it's sci fi, but I feel like there, you know, we talked about a little bit. That's it's it's probably some some truth to that. And I think. Uh, oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like I feel like maybe we should get into that now. Like, I think that maybe uh, if you want to talk about the book, we can we can we can. Yeah, because. Uh, I think we said it was it was it ties into a lot about uh, what we're hearing today, and I don't know how to not get into it. I haven't I haven't read it yet, but I have. Uh, I don't want to get into spoilers, so if I get into ask too many okay, questions, okay, I, I won't I won't I won't spoil it. But you know, everyone who's read it say, "Are you sure this is a sci-fi?" They they need to come up with a new category um, called nonfiction sci-fi. Because this, this is, you're, you're spilling the beans on a lot of things that are actually happening in the world right now under the guise of science fiction. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of things that people don't know about. And of course, you know, having been a therapist, you hear a lot of things from people in areas, you know, that uh, are, have access to information that the rest of us don't have. And besides knowing some of those things, I also was, um, I also, uh, as I was writing it, uh, I was being told things <laughs> to put in it that would try to awaken people's knowledge about certain things and then go out and do their own research on it. But uh, the character, the character was kind of interesting because I'm a psychologist. I really got into the psychopathology of all the characters. I could write it from a perspective that, you know, I've seen a lot of strange uh, disorders in my life. And this particular young um, employee has um, acquired savant syndrome. And um, savant syndrome, when you acquire it, it means it usually happens when you're younger, you maybe have had an accident, you've had a brain injury because of it. And because of he's had this, this uh, baseball accident at the age of seven, his brain gets wired a little differently. And he becomes sort of like a math and algorithm genius, and he sees he's he gets synesthesia, which means he sees the world in numbers. Hmm. So he can see you in numbers. He can see everything in numbers. And those numbers can turn out to be a curse and a blessing at the same time because it helps him crack a code that gets into this library of truth. So, um, so yeah, I made sure all my characters were very realistic, were deep, had, uh, had human flaws, you know, that they needed to overcome. And, um, you know, uh, as, as all of the reviews on my books have said, people said, oh, these books are addictive, you know, and, um, I, I read it in my jammies from the morning until late at night. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear that all the time. And, um, you know, it wasn't like I tried to do that. I, I like to write books that keep me enthralled. Now, you know, it's, uh, people say, oh, this is a, a movie in the making. That's for sure. Or a television series in the making. Um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, national treasure meets numbers meets X files type of thing. 
And uh, so I, uh, I, I really, really got into it. And, and it, I thought it was going to be one book. It turned into three. And then I decided to do what happens uh, ten, 20 years later to one of the main little girl characters in the book, and who's very psychic. And she's dealing with AI issues. So, um, so, yep. So the fourth book, which will come out, uh, should come out the end of next month or the beginning of March, um, will be a look into the future. Sounds really cool. So we talked about like how these books are about interdimensional portals. And I think that's a, a key keyword, especially the way that the, the news is running with, uh, uh, I would say UAP, UFO, whatever they call them now, uh, but all those events have seemed to have been tied into yeah. interdimensional, which is kind of changing the language on how people are talking about what we've always thought to be aliens. And it kind of also kind of spins on like what that means and where they're from. Like how, how does that relate to, to, to your books and your writing? Well, I had a really interesting experience when I was in my 20s. I mean, it wasn't my first kind of psychic experience, but it was a very, very unusual one. I, I don't know. I tend to to attract strange experiences. And um, and this one, I it was in a dream. I was having a lucid dream. I mean, it felt so real. It felt like I was actually there. And I found myself on a spaceship, a huge one. And I... Uh, I, I found myself talking to the commander of this ship, very tall being. Uh, I didn't get at the time, you know, where they were from, but he was definitely very humanoid looking. And this was way, way before the time of Bluetooth technology. And everyone on that ship had on these little tiny devices in their ear, almost like a band, a gold band that set up a communication with the rest of the ship. And he was telling, it was sort of like, it, it felt like he hadn't seen me for a long time. I mean, he he acted like I had with some long lost friend, which, but I don't remember him. I mean, he felt familiar, but, you know, cognitively, uh, you know, I couldn't say who it, it was. But the interesting thing was that, um, uh, I, you know, I wasn't abducted or anything like that. I mean, it was a very, uh, it felt like a very uplifting experience of just mind to mind talking about science. And, uh, the next thing I knew is as we were saying goodbye, there was this tremendous exchange of energy between us. And the next thing I, I found, I was back in my, my physical body. And my whole body was shaking, you know, filled with euphoria. And the only thing I can say, it was kind of like orgasmic. And, you know, and um, I never experienced anything like that before. And it was so profound, I, you know, thinking about this, that years later, when I went um, and spent uh, with Dr. Stephen Greer, he's part of the UFO project and so forth, and with remote viewing, and I was out in the desert with him with about uh, 10 and uh, about 20 people, 15, 20 people, and in the Arizona desert, um, it was uh, in the middle of nowhere, so we weren't anywhere near cars or towns or anything, so it was like pitch black, and we were doing remote viewing and trying to make contact, and the very first time I was there, you know, uh, he didn't know who I, my name yet or anything, and uh, we were all in the circle in our zero gravity lounge chairs and so forth, you know, uh, meditating, and then he, he stops and he goes, oh my goodness, there's a commander of a Federation ship here. I've only seen him once or twice before. I'm not sure why he's here right now, but he's standing right next to, uh, between the person on my, my right and who's ever on the, who's ever next to her, which happened to be me. And of course, I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking, oh my God, is this the commander of my ship from when I was in my twenties? So that, that night I was, I was in my bed and I asked for a sign. I said, is this, is this my commander? And in the middle of the night, I woke up and all these streams of light were coming from the ceiling, from the walls, everything. And they were going right into my heart chakra. And, and it was like the, the, the incredible euphoric feeling of your heart being flooded with some type of like unconditional love or something like that. And, and I knew in that moment, okay, that's my confirmation. It was the commander that I met in my twenties on board that ship. So um, I haven't been back to my knowledge on that ship since that time, uh, but I have remote viewed in space and seen other things that uh, people really don't know. I mean, I, this was years ago, and I remember seeing that uh, there is um, a portal going through the sun, 
And I was out remote viewing in space. And by the way, I was taught remote viewing by um, Russell Targ, the granddaddy of, you know, Russell and um, Hal Putoff. They they worked on the Stanford uh, Research Project for the military. And I happened to be in Northern California at the time, met, met uh, Russell at a party, and we got to talking about it. And he said, oh, yeah, anybody can learn it. And so... Uh, a number of us got together and he taught us, not at the party, but outside the party. And, uh, you know, it just takes practice. But anyway, um, so I was, uh, when I was with Dr. Greer in the desert, you know, I remember um, uh, I, I suddenly found myself out in space and I saw something emerge from the sun. And at first I couldn't understand what that was. And as I'm trying to go closer, I see it's a spaceship coming out of this black triangular area on the sun. And if you do look at the sun, there is a, a kind of a triangular black patch there. And so I decided, and then I saw another ship going into it. And, and I was curious, like, Whoa, what is this? Where, where are they going? What is this place? So I decided, and I didn't know if I could and, and not, but I tried it. I said, well, I wonder if I could mentally hitch a ride on one of those ships going in. And I was able to do that, you know, without knowing I could. I tethered myself to it. And as I'm going through that black patch on the sun, you, you think you'd burn up or something like that. And no, I didn't feel the heat, but it felt like you're going through some type of time warp. It was very fast, very, um, uh, it, it was like a horizon event or something. I can't, it's hard to describe, but on the other side, there were the most amazing colors, colors that we really don't have here. And I realized it was an opening to a different universe. And there was all these ships lined up in an arc formation. And, and the ships that were coming through this portal, sun portal, they were beaming light at each of these ships, which then kind of identified who was on the ship. And, and sort of like, you know, when we, our boats, we, we, our flag of our country, this was kind of the same thing. And immediately I understood whatever this light was, it was somewhat of a, all I can explain, it was like a decontamination process coming from one uh, dimension into another. And uh, and I don't know if it was they did the same thing for those going in back into our dimensional sphere. But um, the ship that I was on, um, it it resonated uh, this beautiful violet color, which happens to be one of my favorite colors. And I thought, oh, good. And they let them through right away. So I have no idea who was on that ship. But as soon as, as somehow I got locked onto and immediately I was just propelled back out through that, that, that uh, portal and, and back into our dimensional realm. Cause it's like, you don't belong here, or at least you don't belong here right now. Um, but I do know that, you know, it was like, wow, you know, that there's a lot more things going on in space. And, and then when I, I found myself outside the, uh, rings of Saturn, and I didn't see the rings, but there was two moons. And I'm thinking in my head, uh, oh, what what planet has two moons? And it came to me right away, Saturn. Saturn has more than two moons, but this this must be Saturn. And there was a huge spaceship parked outside the rings of Saturn. And so what I did was I I look I I propelled myself inside the ship. And it was a big ship. It was sort of, uh, you know, like something out of Star Trek, how big, you know, a citywide type of, of ship size. And um, there were these all different types of beings, but the beings, I was drawn over to one area of the um, the ship. And it looked like they, it, they were assembling what looked like some type of um, rocket. Uh, it probably wasn't a rocket, but it was cylindrical like that. And they were, they were inserting rods up into it and or repairing it or something. And I didn't know what they were doing. And I'm thinking in my mind, well, what's, what's that for? And I hear as clear as could be, you know, through mental telepathy, um, this is to diffuse weaponry in space. And then I remembered, you know, going back many years when, you know, Russia was way ahead of us in the space race. And we were trying to show how fast, you know, how, how mighty we were. We were sending up, you know, like missiles into space towards the moon. And all of those missiles went offline. 
all of them. I mean, none of them made them. And to this day, I think there was like seven or so of them. No one's been able to explain it. So I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if these guys or whatever this this technology is, you know, it it assisted in that process. And then I it, I had a thought to myself, well, I wonder who programs these things. And again, I heard, and these weren't the exact words, was that um, uh, it, no specific person um, uh, of programs that it somehow locks into or taps into source knowledge. And it said, the, the thing that I really did here as clear as could be, it always knew the, the right thing to do, uh, sort of like the right humanitarian thing or so forth. And right at that time, um, Dr. Greer was talking about consciousness-assisted technology. And I didn't say anything because I thought, you know, did I make it up? I mean, it was pretty, you know, pretty detailed what I saw out in space. And then when he was talking about consciousness-assisted technology, you know, that the mind and 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 could could affect, you know, matter through this, I I told the group about this experience. And Dr. Greer got really quiet. <laughs> And he goes, I want you all to listen to what Kathy has just said. He said, because a number of years ago when the Cassini probe did their probe of Saturn, they scrubbed a lot of pictures coming back because they saw that there was a huge craft parked outside the rings of Saturn and they suspected it was there for a quite a long time. He said the military freaked at it. And so, you know, I know I said I've seen it. I mean, there was weird fiber optics on that before. Um, you know, before I really knew, understood anything about fiber optics, I could see outside the ship, but I couldn't see inside the ship from looking outside of it. And there was a lot of technology in it, like I couldn't explain. So, you know, I've, I've, I've had some very strange experiences, either remote viewing. I mean, there was one other time I will tell you this because I was in, I was, uh, in Arizona and I was, I was there remote viewing and I suddenly found myself above, um, uh, a U.S. base. And the reason I say that is because I could see the plane insignia. And I knew immediately uh, this is a U.S. aircraft parked down there. And I don't want to be I don't want to be remote viewing over a base because I know that they they have ways to lock on to you you know, uh, energetic ways to lock onto you. And I just said to myself, well, I'd, I'd rather know where the ET bases are. <laughs> I mean, just kind of jokingly. And the next I heard him, I had looked to the artificial mountain. And of course, it's it's dark as dark at night. There's no way you could look to any mountain. And uh, But in my mind's eyes, it led me to this one area that it didn't have an opening like a mountain would, but I suddenly found myself going deep, deep down, miles down into this uh, fake mountain, I guess. And there were all these tunnels down there, huge tunnels that you could have, you know, you could have driven a 747 through. And they were all lit up, like, but with no source of lighting on the walls or ceiling or anything and no shadows either, which I, I thought was strange. And no people. I didn't know what it was down mm. there, but it was, you know, all these that went on. And and so I wandered around a little bit, but I realized, you know, I probably didn't see anything really in comparison to how, how extensive they were. But something brought me, lured me over to this one area. And on the wall, I saw all this writing and it wasn't it, you know, and I've been to Egypt and I know what hieroglyphics look like and it wasn't hieroglyphic. Mm. And it, uh, you know, could have been ancient Sumerian or cuneiform or maybe in even an alien language. I have no idea. Um, but it was the whole wall was filled with these symbols. And then I, I, I saw that there was something around the wall. So I look, I kind of peek around, you know, in my mind, because I'm still in my ass, my, my mind state, not in a physical state. And there is like a 10 foot tall praying mantis sitting on a pillow, I mean, almost like meditating. It was so bizarre. And his antenna were going out and just sort of like, you know, into the, it knew immediately that I was in the room. And with its antenna and its energy, it just pushed me out. And the next thing I found myself is going right up the mountain, right through the mountain, back into my chair, back to where I was uh, remote viewing. And so I can say I've been I've been pushed out of a lot of places while I've been remote viewing. But that was the most bizarre one, 10 foot tall, 
um, you know, praying mantis. I mean, maybe eight feet, 10 feet. It's hard to tell because he was actually sitting down, but he was very, very tall being. Yeah, I think and, I've, I've seen that on uh, uh, just people talking about like the different types of entities and things that they yeah. believe to be. And that, that's that seems to be uh, one that I, I've I've heard about before, which almost sounds like the craziest one uh, because yeah. it's so it's so familiar. But I guess like yeah. the grays and all those other things are, are humanoid. So when it, something's not, but, it's a little well, bit. Well, I asked Dr. Like, Greer. Go ahead. Uh, it also sounded like you were talking about North Dakota, basically. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, the beings there. Well, I it's said pretty something. Pretty much the whole to, thing's a base. To Doctor Greer, and he goes, "Oh, those are the teachers." But when I checked in with my guides, uh, they said, "No, that's not the full story." You know, there's good mantises and there's bad mantises, just like there's good humans and bad mantises. And they said, "The gra- the mantises are the ones that are really controlling the greys." And they stay in the background so that the greys get the bad rap, you know. And then I remembered hearing about some abduction experiences where somebody would say, you know, I kind of saw a large mantis in the background just watching and not saying anything. So, uh, you know, so it's sort of like, uh, okay, guys, <laughs> you know, you're maybe not what you say you are. And... um so yeah, it uh, so it's like I said, uh, you know, I I know Greer always said, oh, there's all good aliens, and I'm I'm I'll have to say that's terribly naive thinking, you know, um, just like anyone saying there's all good human beings, you know, it just doesn't doesn't flush, doesn't right. fly. How did yeah. you get hooked up with Stephen Greer? Um, I had gone to a lecture of his and I thought, you know, this is be, be really cool to spend a week in the desert. You know, we spent all day meditating. When you're doing all day of meditation, your intuitive and psychic properties really get uh, pumped up. And so, um, you know, you're, you're finishing people's sentences, you're, you're seeing things, you know, it's, and, and it's, if people meditated more, they'd probably be more in tune with the world at large. But, you know, it's sort of like I had the luxury then of spending maybe seven hours in meditation during the day. And at night between like 10 p.m. and 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, we go out and do remote viewing while everybody else is sleeping, you know. And uh, so uh, this was many, many years ago. You know, I know he's gotten into a lot of different things since then. You know, and but uh, um, it just it just strengthened my understanding that, um, you know, there's a lot of strange things out there. Um, I, you know, when, when I was in my 20s as well, I spent time with uh, Bob Monroe of the Monroe Institute, Journeys Out of Body, he wrote. And that was like the second year he was in existence, you know, before he became famous. And so I knew Bob when he was still alive. And awesome. I had some out-of-body ex- journeys with him during the, that time. Uh, you know, some uh, some one of them he wrote about in his second book. Uh, it's anonymous. And years later, people said, you know, I, I came because I wanted to have what that girl experienced. And it was an astral sex experience, you know, in, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, everybody wanted to have one of those. Uh, it was quite profound. But, um, and, uh, you know, so you, sometimes you don't expect what things are going to happen. So I went back like about 30 years later, and Bob was long gone. And, you know, it had become so commercialized. And, you know, I'm sitting at the table and people are talking about, you know, why they came. And, you know, they're already like, oh, I want that experience that that girl had in book two. And I'm sitting there thinking, Bob Monroe owes me money. (laughs) (laughs) I was free publicity for him. (laughs) So the remote viewing, I kind of want to hear more about that. Because you mentioned, uh, you know, out-of-body experience, remote viewing, uh, astral projection. Are those all kind of the same or like, are they they different for you or... Uh, they're different, you know. Uh, astral projection. Um, I mean, you're 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 using your etheric body to get out of your body and lift. I mean, here's a perfect experience would be um, the first time I went to Egypt. I was alone in the um, king's chamber with three other people for about two hours. Um, and I lay down in the sarcophagus, which really isn't a sarcophagus. Uh, there's no bodies or Egypt mummies that have ever been found in any of these, these pyramids. You know, that's a fallacy. 
And but it's a great toning chamber. I mean, because the, the acoustics in the King's Chamber are just amazing. So I'm laying down in the chamber uh, in the sarcophagus, and I just started to tone, chanting or so forth to feel the reverberation of the stone because the stone is filled with quartz crystal, which has a resonance to it. And so I'm feeling this going through my body, and then the next minute I see in my mind's eye uh, a sarcophagus lid come over and and entomb me in it. Now, there really is no lid there in real life. And, you know, for that brief second, I thought, oh, my God, I'm entombed. And uh, then I heard my guides in my head say, well, you know what to do. And I realized I did. I slowed down my breathing and I found myself lifting out of my physical body. I mean, there's an actual difference, obviously, from remote viewing, you're sending your mind out. Astral is, you're actually separating from your physical body. Your astral body is, is separating. And all of a sudden, this big hole opened in the bottom of the sarcophagus that was filled with light. And I suddenly find myself going down this hole. And, and you know, part of me thinking, well, you know, aren't I supposed to be going up? This is kind of an ascension chamber. Why am I going down into the pyramid? And I was able to see uh, chambers in there that have not been discovered yet. Um, I saw the what looked like the, the remains of an old city way, way down. And then underneath the pyramid, way down underneath the pyramid were water tunnels. Now, nobody had ever talked to me about there being water tunnels under the Great Pyramid. Okay, just, yeah. Yeah. And... Um, so it took, and, and, and then as I'm going through the water tunnels, I, I come up through some type of passageway that goes right up through the Sphinx and out through the head of the Sphinx. And I didn't know at the time there was a hole on top of the Sphinx's head. And unfortunately, I just zoomed right out of the head of the Sphinx. And then somebody, uh, one of the people in my group in real life, leaned over the sarcophagus's uh, edge and said, are you done in there yet, Kathy? Because I'd been in there pretty long. And I was whoosh, right back into my physical body. So I don't know what would have happened. But I was determined from then on to get down to those tunnels. So uh, it took it took quite a while of finagling with the Egyptian government, you know, um, you know, how much. And first of all, they wanted to know how I knew about the water tunnels down there because they had been discovered in 1952 by um, an Egyptologist called Dr. Salim Hassan. And uh, then, you know, who they built a little pier in there because so he could work off of. And then then they closed it down. It was called the Osiris Shaft. And and you can't bring groups down there because the liability is off the charts. You know, you got to go down iron rung ladders that, you know, are rickety and there's three levels and so forth like that. And so we, you know, the first they kept saying, no, no, you can't go. And, you know, we kept at it. I kept at it with my Egyptologist friend. And they finally agreed to a price. And I thought, uh, done, done deal. I would have paid a lot more, but they thought it was a lot. Is that always what it takes? It's just the amount of money it takes to, to, to get now, in there? All it takes is, is the right amount of money. So exactly. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you're like the greatest scientist in the world or, or if you're just somebody... Wow, now, you, still, you still got to pay. But since I was nobody, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't anyone a super famous or so forth like that, you know, and I could tell that they were suddenly that they were they were looking at me from afar. And so I just tried to stay very meek. And I, I'm just I'm just curious. And I just want to see the water tunnel so that they didn't think I had any nefarious, you know, reasons for wanting to do this or why I knew about them. So we did we did uh, negotiate and um you know, uh, it was like 4 a.m. in the morning when uh, and that uh, with just our flashlights, the head of the Giza Plateau, my Egyptologist uh, buddy and myself, uh, we're walking over the uh, the Giza Plateau to uh, a little place near the causeway. It's like a ramp causeway. And there's a little iron door underneath. And he hands me the key and he said, you want to open? I said, sure. So, you know, I open it and it's kind of airless and stuffy when you go in. And there's, like I said, three levels, and you got to go down three rickety iron ladders that are, you know, and we're talking about 150 feet. And, um, how, and how first, claustrophobic is it? Because, like, I, it's always been like a dream right. of mine. Like, I think, you know, Egypt, and like, I'm sure we'll get into this, you know, and like how the pyramids got built and all those things Same. and how they relate, you know, and is the pyramid something that has to do with energy and, you know, like in Tesla, like discovery. Oh, it had to things. do with a lot of things. But, like, I, I, electric. I, 
hydroelectric power plant was most likely when the Nile River was ten miles that closer. A, a, <laughs> I'll get but, into that in a minute. But I, but but, I always uh, wanted to go there, and like I just, but, I, but I can't imagine being in like, you know, I don't know. I just see all these. I, I barely go in a cave, so I was just curious, like. I've been down smaller tunnels like the well shaft in the Great Pyramid, which they, you know, tourists don't go down. Now, that is if you have claustrophobia, you don't want to go down there because you're on your hands and knees crawling and your back is being scraped yeah, by no, the. You. Sea, yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's no backing up. You have to keep going, you know, because you can't turn around in there. You know, it's uh, it's like claustrophobic cave diving. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm not going to do that. No. Nope. So the first the first level didn't have much, and the second level had seven big niche openings where sarcophaguses had been. Now there was only two still there. They kind of looked like they were black granite. Uh, maybe they could have been black basalt. I you know I don't know a lot about stone, but I remember um, they had the covers on them, but the covers were askew. So I looked down in them, and they're so perfectly formed, and I could still see resin in the seams. And I knew in that moment that my suspicions were right. You know the. Um, the Romans did not invent concrete. <laughs> the Egyptians had that technology way before from the from the Atlanteans and everything else. And so what they did is they pulverized their stone because if you look closely at some of those stones on the pyramid, you might find hair, you might find fingernails. You know, and regular yeah. stone doesn't have those human elements in it, so you know it's been mixed like concrete and then sculpted or something. You were saying that the Romans didn't invent it, though. No, yeah. everybody thinks that, you know, it, it was the Romans that invented concrete and it went way back before them. So that's why they think, oh, those, those stones had to be quarried and sculpted or something else. But what they would do is they would mix them. They would pulverize the stone, mix it with other agents, make forms and set it in place. You could see there was no way they could have gotten those those sarcophaguses down those shafts in the Osiris shaft. They had to make it on the spot. So, and when I saw resin in the seam, inside seams of the sarcophagus there, you know, I knew, you know, that, you know, you just don't find that with, with the, uh, and, and sometimes you see statues in Egypt, you know, that uh, are supposed to be marble or quartz fall over and you realize that they have some hollow, hollowness inside them. And that's not a sculpted cord, you know. So, um, yeah, all that stuff that we've been fed. I mean, I, I, you know, I hate to say this about the Egyptians, but if they don't know anything, they just make it up. So uh, <laughs> there was there were times I would go to certain places that I remembered. It would re reawaken my memories of being in ancient Egypt. And they'd say certain, oh, this was this. And I'd go, no, it wasn't. And then I'd tell them what it was for. And they go, oh, Oh, I guess that makes more sense. <laughs> but, you know, it's sort of like saying that nothing goes back more than 4,000 years. Well, you know, even Edgar Cayce said the pyramids went back 11,500 or years or more, and the Sphinx went back even further than that. But the reason that the Egyptians won't follow that particular, um, you know, uh, uh, timeline is because it interferes with the religion and Allah. And so, you know, as many things in in our world, if it threatens any type of religious beliefs, you know, it's usually nullified. Yeah. And I mean, the same, yeah. That, I mean, that's with aliens and that's with, uh, I don't know, a lot of things. I think uh, when we may have talked about when we talked before, but like uh, big into Graham Hancock and like the uh, ancient apocalypse and like, again, like I think yep. it doesn't meet, match the narrative. It, it can't be true. And I think just as a species, maybe we're just not comfortable with question marks. Which is why, it's you know, I'm not system. saying that there wasn't, you know, some alien involvement. I'm sure there was, but yeah. you know, we've lost so much of our history. You know, um, uh, lands have gone down, civilizations have been lost, and some of them were much, much more advanced. And some of those survivors did come to Egypt and brought some of their technology with them. You know, it's sort of like we're. Um, I just saw recently, my guide showed me that Anubis, the god that you know, black jackaled jackal looking god yeah. that uh, he's uh, the god of the afterlife for the underworld uh, mummification um and so forth the protector of the giza plateau they showed me that he was actually an ai robot and i'm thinking oh my god really and 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 he was put in charge of what's ever under the sphinx 
holding all of that 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 knowledge that we can't seem to get to that you know Casey talks about. And and so I thought, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if anybody else has come across the fact that Anubis might have actually been AI because he's never talked about anywhere else in Egypt except in that realm. And so I started doing a search and I thought, oh, isn't it interesting? There's a lot of video games out there that refer to Anubis as being AI, a robot. And I thought it's already in the collective consciousness. They know that the, what this was at one time. That sounds mm-hmm. familiar for some reason, but I'm a gamer. Stargate. But- Right. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say next. Dean Anderson like, would be really, really impressed right now. Yes, because yeah. Stargate, I mean, <laughs> Abydos Temple, They in Stargate, they, they use the, the term Abydos. Abydos is one of the oldest temples there. Uh, of course, there's an older temple built underneath it, which is why they call it sacred. And I went there and immediately I knew, I said, oh, my God, this is this is the home to the Melchizedek order. And nobody talks about that. I said, this is this mm-hmm. is the cosmic priest to the priest that could look into the future, you know, and there was a natural I knew that there was a natural stargate there. And then I talked with somebody in the military and he had said, he said, yeah, we, we have this was many years ago. We had the technology to bring E.T. home. There was we found a natural stargate at Abydos Temple. And I went, oh, my God. And so he told me where it was, you know, and I had been in that temple so many times. And every time I went down this one path, it was like something kept saying, look the other way. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. And I passed it by and on the wall actually was an inscription uh, showing something that looks something out of, like out of um, what is that movie with the Ewoks, you know, and the uh, oh, Return uh, of the Jedi. No, 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 no. Um, it's an old, old movie, you know, and they used a sled, a time sled or something like this. And actually, there's almost like a time sled and carved on the wall. And my Egyptologist says, she goes, oh, my God, I've almost never seen this. And I've walked down this this hallway so many times. And it was, and the way the guy described it to me was exactly that hallway. And it's, you know, it's, uh, I want to say, say exactly where it is. But apparently, it's a natural stargate that is a shifting. It opens. Uh, I don't know how they get it to open, but somehow they had technology that would open it. And, uh, you know, then I came across stories of people uh Ancients who had worked at Abydos talking about, you know, falling into dimensional wormholes or something there. I always like so, the, the connection with the, again, because like, you wrote a sci-fi book, but the connection with sci-fi and the real world. Like you were talking about, like, uh, you, the dream experience with the, with the, the aliens and, like, the, the Bluetooth thing, you know, and basically everything that comes up. Most everything that comes out of sci-fi ends up being truth at some point. Like a lot of things that they, they, you know, Dick Tracy's watch and all these other things that like, you know, I mean, I wouldn't call it sci-fi, but you know what I mean? But like all the technologies that they're inventing, you know, eventually become true. So you saw like what would eventually become Bluetooth. We're talking about Stargate, which is totally like a sci-fi movie, but kind of based off of like, I guess, theories from the history of Egypt. I I make jokes with my family or my kids mostly. Like, I'm like, I hope I'm, I'm around when we teleport. And they're like, that's stupid. And I'm like, I don't know if it's stupid. I kind of made it as a joke, but like we manifest our own reality. Yeah, so. but if they're gonna if they're teleporting right. in Star Trek, then there's a good chance, you know, everything else they've come up with has come true. Like all of it does. So it's just kind of a, a cool tie-in to all that. Except but, for zombies. We get everything yeah. except for zombies. <laughs> okay, well, that is also I mean, a terrifying thing. That that that's that's you know why I thought, you know, this is much more interesting to weave it into all of the things that I've discovered over time that really are true and weave it into a sci-fi book. So I'm kind of safe, maybe off the off the realm from, you know, other, you know, PS powers that don't want me to talk about that these things really exist. But but you know, when when I was on that second level in the pyramids, and I'll just finish that story. Yeah. You know, those seven niches. And I thought immediately this was this, there were seven gods of the underworld. And I think this was a symbolic tomb thing for them. Mm-hmm. And then when I went down the last uh, last rings of the ladder onto the, the, the very final level, there was water lapping around the rings uh, of the the rungs of the, the ladder. And um, there was water and you could see tunnel, you know, a tunnel opening there. The water was probably about hip deep. There was uh, that that old pier from Dr. Salim Hassan that was leaning over. There was there was papyrus and driftwood in the pape in in the water. And there was a sarcophagus buried under the water. You could see it. 
And so I turned to the Giza Plateau guy and I said, has anybody ever tr- opened this? And he goes, no, we can't open it. And oh, he didn't say we can't open. He says, no. And I thought, well, I'm, I, why hasn't anybody tried to open it? And then I heard in my mind, my guide said, well, they won't be able to open it because it's hermetically sealed and you have to have the right DNA to open it. Which probably you and I don't have the right DNA, no. you know, um, but it was interesting. I had planned on, <clears throat> excuse me, taking water samples while I was down there and I hadn't told anybody in case they would, tried to stop me. So as I'm taking the water uh, samples out of my backpack, uh, the bottles for it, um, my key card, you know, from the Mina House Hotel, which is right next to the uh, pyramids, is a very historical hotel. It goes flying out of my backpack. Now, you know, if something falls out of a backpack, it falls straight down by your feet. This didn't. It flew out into the water right onto the sarcophagus. You know, it was sort of like how symbolic a key card, (laughs) you know, (laughs) the sarcophagus and and the um, uh, the Giza Plateau guy. He's taking a little stick and he's trying to fish it out and it's just digging it deeper into the silt. So to this day, my key card is still down there in the Osiris shaft. And somebody, somebody's going to yeah. find it someday. If anybody's listening and you go down there, uh, look for it. I think uh, you have a deposit on that. Do you get money back if we find that? Like, <laughs> Well, when I went back, they said, well, where'd you lose? And I said, oh, somewhere around. <laughs> yeah. You know, somewhere and the water around. showed, the water showed that it had a higher, uh, it wasn't contaminated and uh, it had a higher count of salinity in it than would have been natural because um at one time the nile river came up to the sphinx temple near the sphinx not the pyramid itself and then after they built the aswan dam back i think it was in the 70s or something like that you know a lot of things got relocated and the nile river is now like about five miles from the great pyramid and it's a freshwater river it's not a salt river so I'm trying to figure out at the time, well, where's the salt coming from? And, you know, we kind of ruled out that it wasn't leaching off the walls. And so I had to do, I had to start tracking water sources around there that had turned from salt, uh, like fresh water to salt or salt water to fresh or whatever. And it was like 75 miles away in Hawara. And so I went to Hawara and um, uh, they had, Covertly done, you know, some, um, oh, I forgot her name now. Um, uh, she, she asked the Egyptian government if she could do uh, sound uh, penetrating radar to see what was underneath the Hawara pyramid. And of course they said no, because they're always afraid you're going to find something that's, that, that's going to skew up their, <laughs> the, the, uh, um, yeah. their narrative. And so she did it anyway on the sly. And, Underneath there were like huge football field with rooms and tunnels that that were like uh, um, football size fields and, you know, three different levels of it. And, you know, they weren't water tunnels, so nobody knows what that was. But when I went there, there was a lot of moguls in the sand, which told me there was collapsing. They were collapsing and there was there was water. It, the, one of the tunnels that collapsed and you could see there was still water. So I think. In my mind's eye, I saw them start their journey when, you know, a pharaoh or somebody of importance died. They started their symbolic journey on their their boats, maybe at Hawara, in the underwater tunnels until they came to the tunnel underneath the Great Pyramid where that buried doorway, which was, uh, uh, my guide said, it's a portal. It's It's a portal. That's why it's hermetically sealed. It's a portal. And uh, I think that that's, that's kind of because that, the whole idea of that, that, that pyramid was used for uh, an ascension device into the next world. So uh, there's a lot of pieces missing in the puzzle. I mean, I know it was used at one time as a hydroelectric power plant. Uh, it was used for, you know, initiations and things like that. So um, it's had many, many, many different uh um uh purposes over the course of millennia but you know basically it you know the it was helped with the help of Atlant- atlantean knowledge now if you want to call them the aliens fine maybe they they were in touch with the octurians and others that had you know much more knowledge but you know that's the missing pieces that we don't have 
And, you know, if you go back in some of your ancient texts, they all talk about another land and it all sounds very close to Atlantis, Atlantia, yeah. you know, and it's yeah. all very. And, and yeah. you know that uh, that there's some there's uh, missing pieces in there. And I just it just definitely all signs point to yes that that was the the next civilization before like Mesopotamia or the Sumerians maybe they were there around the same time as the Sumerians or something in a different portion but yeah definitely it was a, a previous culture that has long since been kind of uh, buried uh, maybe literally with water and sand but like under even underneath the the Great Pyramids in Egypt there there are like seven more pyramids buried under the sand in that whole area and there's like all kinds of all kinds of crazy secrets surrounding the yeah they haven't even found half of what's what's buried there in fact there's a law that if you if you if you live anywhere near the giza plateau you cannot dig underneath in like your basements or anything else or you'll go directly to jail do not pass go because people are finding (laughs) these tunnels and they're finding antiquities i mean everything is you know buried upon other things i mean there's you can like even in abydos temple you if you there's one area that's pushed aside and you could see big pillars that are done under Underneath it, so it was. It was, you know, built on an, another another tunnel. By the way, Great Pyramid is not the only pyramid in the world that has water tunnels under. When I started doing research, I found that uh, Chichen Itza in uh, Can- Cancun, Mexico area, uh, Cancun area, Cozumel, okay. excuse me, Cozumel, um, and uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico has water pyramid water tunnels under it. So does the uh, Bosnian pyra- pyramid in uh, Croatia. And I'm sure there's plenty of others. So these were all Atlantean outposts at one time, you know, uh, and and some of them went down underwater. There's we found some underwater pyramids off of Japan. You know, I mean, there's a, a, a there's pyramids everywhere in Mexico. I mean, small ones, larger ones, medium sized ones. They're all over the place. And some of them have been excavated in the last 20 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, an unusual phenomenon. This, these pyramid, uh, but, but if you try making those same pyramids today, they fall apart. They don't have the structural elements and the, uh, sacred geometry knowledge of how that they were built back then. Yeah. And that's what I like about the, like, uh, Graham Hancock stuff where he talks about like how, how similar all these things are and how the gods are all similar and like how, and we you know how that may have, you know, stemmed from like a, an older civilization. I think he talks about Atlantis as well. Um, and I, I was going to say too, like when you, and I think these been popping up in my feed because the internet shows me what I need to see. Right. I don't need to think for myself. Uh, just kidding. But, but, but I'll see like pictures of like, you know, when they started first ex- excavating the things in Egypt and like how you only see the top of it. Like, or like when you think about Easter Island, like you, they were just heads, but you know, if you dig deeper, there's probably more to right. them. The whole, no, the whole body is definitely there. Yeah. Like, but they just, yeah. there's just like the, that progression. <laughs> so like the, the, the deeper we, we dig the more we find uh graham hancock t- you know talks a lot about and you kind of said it too like the earth was different then so places that are uninhabitable now were very habitable then so like he's been saying you know there's this hair desert we're not doing enough like lidar and checking under the ground there and he said the same thing about the amazon and i think last week they found another like city uh underneath the amazon uh, that, that, that they have to exca- excavate and explore and I, I just think that all that's very interesting uh, but I guess, like, the question I don't want to get away from is that, like, when for you in Egypt, because you spend a lot of time and, like, you know, uh, ex- have experiences there. So, what do you think it was the, the Egyptians, or you think it was like it's like most of these things where they think uh, people just kind of moved in and took over these 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 places? So it wasn't the Egyptians that built it. And no, no, I think they went to the you know there was ancient they when they had the final third and final flood you know, major flood, you know, and there was mass exodus to the survivor refugees went to other areas and some of them had this knowledge and Egypt was one of them. So they taught the ancient Egyptians. Now the Egyptians like to say, you know, it's like, you know, well, we're just so smart. We came all, you know, all of a sudden we went from, you know, primitive tools to, to, you know, building these precise geometric pyramids and so forth. You know, it's sort of like you're going, uh, that usually doesn't happen that way. There's, you know, there's usually some steps in between and um you know it's uh the, the whole thing that 
you know, Khufre uh, and Cheops and so forth like that built the pyramids. I mean, that's that's a lot of bunk. Their only their only yeah. uh, evidence of that was a little tiny statue they found of Khufre in the Great Pyramid that maybe some worker left behind, and then they immediately jumped to the conclusion Khufre built this. They now found it, they found it right next to a card uh, from a hotel. <laughs> I think that's where they found it. That, that's right, the yeah. key card. Fun, fun the fact. Key card. And a Gideon card. Bible, right? Yeah, they think somebody <laughs> came from their hotel and dropped this figure and then also lost their keys. There's probably keys or something next to it. Too, so. Right. I mean, that's just not how you 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 figure yeah. things out. And the thing is, if you do research, you find that Khufre was. A, a restoration pharaoh. Just like we restore all of our old monuments, the during the Middle Kingdom and you know the later kingdom, they were still you know restoring these old things. And some of them said uh, you know at back as as late as the early 1800s, there was still white granite on the face of the uh, Great Pyramid with writings all over it and you're thinking like they ripped off a lot of that and used it in building projects in cairo or in egypt and it's like oh my god that could have told us everything we needed to know yeah i have i would really like to talk about this for a second all right so um uh i want to say like at least a decade ago uh, and you mentioned this earlier about the blocks inside the pyramids being made of quartz on the inside of the stones um I had at one point heard that the whole outer layer of the Great Pyramid was quartz. And uh, it looks like it's all been stripped away except for, you know, like the very top of it has still some granite layer. But I heard it was quartz and then granite. And then... Well, there's mica, there's quartz, there's yeah. limestone. There's a number of things. It's not just quartz alone. But it has... A, where there's quartz... Quart I mean, quartz is like... It, we have quartz components in all of our electronics. So sure. it's a conductor, right. you know? It, I remember it being in videos. I remember it being talked about. I remember seeing, I remember being able to Google search it, that there was an outer layer of quartz on the pyramid. And now when I look, it's interesting. Yeah. I can't there was, find that. There was a, a headstone, I mean, a, a keystone, you know, at the top that's missing as well. And, um, and that was so, gold or they think it was gold. It, it, ha it had gold. It had some silver on it, but it's primarily gold, and it had some quartz in it. It was like the 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 major capacitor for that 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 e uh, the pyramid there. And so one day, um, I was walking up the Grand Gallery, climbing up the Grand Gallery, and there's a core bolted um, walls that go all the way to the top. And instead of making a point, it looks like it's got a fake ceiling up there. You know, and it's very high, so nobody can reach it unless you had, you know, like a, uh, a four-story ladder or something like that. And it always bothered me that, you know, because they're so precise, you know, the, the Egyptians about certain things, you know, about the pyramid. Why did this, is this, or is this sort of this bastardization up there? So one day I decided to go remote view it and we'll see what, the, what was up there. And um, there is what looks like a small pyramid, I mean, in relation to the big pyramid. And and I thought, I wonder if that's where they stored the capstone. It's right in the pyramid. Um, and of course, they're not going to go up there and tear anything apart to look for it. But when they did the scan the pyramid project, they did notice that there was uh, a void space up there. And that's all they would say. So ultimately, so. I guess, who do you, what's your theory on like how this was built? Like, I guess, do you, do you have like an idea of what you think happened and how they became uh, what they are? Like what technology was used? Because everybody's trying to, like we talked about, we don't like question marks. So everybody's like, yeah, every yeah. every other week you say, oh, this is probably how they could have done it. And they, I don't know, it's just always. Well, definitely it wasn't built by slaves because they found the workers camps. Agreed. They, Agreed. You know. And and a lot of those workers had uh, you could see that they had had, uh, you know, surgeries done. They had surgical tools back. They had surgeries. And if they were slaves, nobody would have bothered give, doing them surgery and repair. They just would have, you know, killed them and get the next guy in there. You know, so that that didn't flush. Um, you know, whether they used any type of uh, uh, anti-gravity um uh, you know, sound waves, anti-gravity, uh, that's a very possibility. Um, I, I, that's, that's I, I look at, I look at what I can prove, you know, and the other things I can prove, you know, but the sound wave things I can, I can see it in my head, but you know, how are you going to prove that? So, um, but I think that the, uh, ancient 
Atlanteans had access to all that knowledge. And they're much more, much more advanced than we are today. And in fact, it, it seems like a lot of those souls from ancient Atlantis um, have been reincarnating in the last 100 years. And so they're remembering and bringing forth, and that's why we've had such an explosion in technology, because they're bringing forth what they've already worked on years, you know, millennia ago, and bringing, and, and maybe, maybe this time they'll get it right and not screw it up. And, and, uh, because, you know, what I was shown was that um, this whole thing with AI, uh, you know, while it may look good to a lot of people, it's it actually is not good for human evolution. And the reason I was shown this, yeah, uh, yeah was was <laughs> that that um, third dimensional Earth is um, a learning ground for human souls and AI and human souls are not compatible. So after time, because they're not compatible, human souls will stop reincarnating into third dimensional Earth. And eventually, in a couple hundred years, this dimension will collapse because of it. Because of humans need exert some type of biophotonic energy, which helps stabilize and replenish the Earth. There's a, something going like a, on space as well. It's, it, it feeds through the black holes, it feeds through the sun, and so forth, and it's sort of energy replenishment. And if you if you no longer have that in a certain sphere, it dies out just like something, just like a water without plant. Well, like without that. plant, without water. <laughs> I feel like you've got your finger on the pulse of uh, the universe. I would hope so. After all the different things you've gone through or things you've, you've researched, like it seems like it. Do you feel like like all of that, like we could tie back into either it's interdimensional or alien, like does any of that, how does that tie into Atlantis or Egypt? Like uh, is that, is that all of us or where did that come from? Because, you know, well, we I mean, also have these we're little all tiny, aliens. Yeah, <laughs> right. Fair enough. But I mean, like, but we, we just know of each other. And if we're aliens, like, I mean, I, you do you do way cooler shit than I do, so you can. Yeah, I can't do what you do, so you're definitely like on a different level than me. But like, you know, and then we see like these uh, little Peruvian like mummified aliens and things, and like those things are coming up, whether they're true or not. I don't know. I like to believe they are, but it's like it was. Would you feel like in any of this was there any sort of like not us type aliens that were involved in in that education? Kind of tying back into the sci fi stuff that we all love and Stargate, yeah. right? Like. Well, I, I definitely think that we we have invader forces here. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And I think that uh, during some of the upheavals of Earth, I mean, we've already science has already shown we've had at least eight pole reversals, you know, over time. And where lands have gone down, news have emerged, and so forth. And, and po civilizations, populations have been wiped out. And during those times, we were very vulnerable to invading species coming into our planet. And uh, then they started mating with humans that survived and mixing their DNA. And um, and I think that, I, I mean, personally, I think their agenda, call me crazy, but this is what I'm seeing, is to make a, a sexless AI race. And I think that's why this whole transhumanism thing is exploding right now, because they uh, they the whole goal is longevity. They want to live forever and human bodies don't live forever. And that's, that's, they had to overcome that, uh, that, 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 pa that part, you know, and they realized that they could now going back that, okay, I've, I've got to back up for a minute because the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with the afterlife and, you know, they, they would, uh, you know, obviously they'd mummify everything from birds to, animals to flop <laughs> just so they could take it with them in the next life and you have to wonder what was all that all about well i was shown that they had dna abilities back then to extract dna and to not only make a clone in the future from that dna but that dna would not only have the traits and physical characteristics it would have all the memories as well. Now think about that. A clone that has all the memories from the past, you would be able to recreate your whole historical timeline. And, you know, which is like, ah, that's kind of an interesting thought, you know, and that they knew that in ancient Egyptian, 
that they mummified their their servants and their their you know you know uh, mistresses and whatever you know. So if you were you yeah. hung out with the pharaoh, you might have had a short life. So you wanted to make sure that he lived a long time. That you would live a long time because they knew that they could be regenerated in the future. Sort of like, you know, our version of cryo-freeze the body, you know, hoping to find a cure in the future if you've got something that mm. they don't they're not, they don't know how to cure now. And so the I think that there was alien involvement in that because the aliens knew that even though they were mixing their DNA with humans, they knew how to extract it and reconstitute it back to the original species in the future. So um, I, you know, it's I know it sounds it sounds totally sci-fi. My life is like a sci-fi, but you know, this is some of the stuff I'm 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 learning, and you know, maybe it's not true, or maybe maybe it's very true, and and you know, it's just it it pushes people's um, paradigm of thinking about the world and the human race, and uh, that uh, you know we have been invaded by other planets that want to take over earth for their own you know maybe they've screwed up their planet who knows you know um but uh um apparently earth has been designated by some inter i'll just call it intergalactic or interspatial treaty that this is a free will zone for human angelic souls and so they know that they can't push the envelope on free will they will try. That's why I tell everybody today, you know, if something's happening, you better say right away, um, I do not consent. I do not comply. Because if you don't say anything, that is giving your consent. And that that then they avoid all the karmic repercussions of it. You know, see, there's, there's sort of like a uh, get out of jail free card there <laughs> in there. If we don't say anything and stop them and say that this is not okay. You know, well, what do they? I mean, you talk about them, them talking about human souls. What is what is that to them? I guess, in your in your opinion, I know it's like it's not like you can give me all the answers, but I'm just curious. It's like loose energy. They that's why they're some of them are right here stirring the pot because they feed off of strong emotions. Now and and that's sort of like their adrenal chrome or something. You know, it's 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 like it's like their drug of choice. And so you see all these hot spots all over the world and people are stirring it up. And I think that, you know, some of I think some of these people have obviously been taken over by some alien forces and well, influence why they that keep way. us at war. Yes, I've heard, why I've they read that before. Keep yeah. us at war. It's called Lush Energy, L O O S H. I mean, we generate a lot of it. I mean, they, they don't like to hang around if we're all peace and love and everything else because they, 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 they don't get the kick. They don't get the high, you know, from it. And, and so, uh, so, um, yeah, that's, it's, this is, this is what's going on there. Well, that's why that element is, is, uh, this is supposed to be for us, but they're, they're trying to find ways to work around it and depopulate the human agenda here, you know, and so that it makes it much easier for them to, to have this planet. I mean, there's, it's like, like Genghis Khan, there's going to be conquerors, whether it's, you know, from outer space or yeah. whether it's from, you know, Earth itself, there's always that element, um, unfortunately. And, and But in that theory, like, it's still like if the thought that, like, if we knew more about who we were and our origins, that we would be more together and maybe we'd be less buying into all the things and all the religions, which, you know, are definitely manipulated and man-made. But it, it feels like those are people that are, are keeping us from doing that for their control. But maybe there's more to that question mark. Well, it's like many wars have all been, uh, you know, um, fought in the name of religion. All, and, all of them. And, yeah, all <laughs> of them, pretty much. <laughs> and and all the truth has been kept from us because it will imbalance a lot of uh, religious uh, dogmism. You know, so it's uh, um, we're stuck always. That's why the the uh, my books were so important. It was like. Truth. Truth is what we're seeking. This is the age of discernment right now we're in, you know, sifting the wheat from the chaff. And, you know, that's why Stacks and the Stacks was like the library Stacks, because I did a lot of research in the Library of Congress for these books so that it'd be very realistic. And by the way, there's an interesting story. My guides had told me, make sure you get to the Library of Congress to do your research no later than the first week of March of 2020. And this was a couple months earlier than that. And I'm thinking, well, what's the big rush? You know, but I did. I paid attention. 
And I, you know, I worked with the librarians there, you know, got everything down pat. I went through all the tunnels. I did, you know, everything. And the and uh, a week after I left there, uh, everything got shut down for COVID. Yeah. So, I mean, talk about timing. Um, and, of course, the Library of Congress was closed then for uh, a couple of years. And, and, and you know, I would have never had that opportunity to get the accuracy right. So, you know, it's always pay attention to your inner guidance. You know, it's uh, they're steering you the right way. Well, you know? tying, tying that back to the book, I mean, it's it's, you know, about a secret society. They have they know everything about us like and you've had experiences uh, with, uh, you know, outside of this world entities like. And it is about like control, and I, I mean, again, I'm not trying to get into too many of the details, but like, uh, it's a little scary that you're saying that you're writing a book about these things, you know. But it ties into kind of what I was just saying, like if they're trying to limit us and control us, uh, maybe again, sci-fi can become uh, real, or maybe already is, or maybe it just comes from different places. Like, uh, it's a it's a little scary that that's what you're writing about, and that's kind of where our conversation went entertainment is the way we showcase the truth to the people and hope that they see some of it, a glimmer of hope, maybe. <laughs> right. You know, these, or this fourth book, it's, since it goes 20 years into the future is definitely a warning, you know, and I had to look to see what our future looked like physically, what the country looked like when I wrote this book in, in, in Washington, D.C., and even I was shocked, you know, so I'm thinking like, well, we'll see in 20 years if I was right, you know, but uh, yeah, we're, we're in for some mighty changes. There's no doubt about it. Do you feel like the, that they're in cahoots with our, our, our leaders, keeping them rich and keeping us down? Like there's something about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, just look at it this way. My first book took an Antarctica and the base is down there. And, you know, uh, somebody just recently on some show said, why why do when people get, uh, you know, um, they're running for office or they're running from some high, you know, post or so like defense secretary or so forth, they always take a trip down to Antarctica, like, you know, Kerry, John Kerry. Or okay, let's, those let's guys. show them now. Let's yeah, yeah. It's them. like, you know, what's really going on down there? And, you know, it's sort of like. I mean, you know, we've got reverse engineered craft. I mean, please. I mean, I don't even I don't even, <laughs> yeah. I don't even doubt any of that stuff now, you know, and I've seen in Maui where I lived, I've seen uh, UFOs here as well, you know, and, uh, um, you know, you just most of the time people aren't looking up in the skies. That's it. I am. And I don't see shit. And it's kind of depressing. But one day, one day I will see the things. I, I've you know, seen a ahead. lot of the things in the sky. <laughs> Did 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 you uh, see the 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 newest video, which is that jellyfish alien that just came out? Well, actually, that's kind of funny because many years ago, um, I saw it up in the sky in Santa Monica, and I took a picture of it, and it looks like the weirdest thing. And then when this came out, and this was like uh, maybe twenty seventeen or something, I took the picture. Still have it. And uh, when it was going around, I think uh, there was, uh, I, I sent it to a few people. I said, uh, we've already seen this in 2017 in Santa Monica. And nobody could figure out what it was. Yeah, there was one day I was uh, riding down P.E. Lani Highway. That's our main drag here in uh, uh, Highway in, in Maui. And something told me, look up in the sky. And I did. And there's this very strange cloud formation that looked like it was, a portal, a hole going into something else. And, you know, I'm driving and I'm trying to take a picture of it because it's like so bizarre. And then a friend who lives on Kauai, another island over, said, we saw that same cloud formation that day. And we took Damn. pictures of it as well. We knew that inside or, you know, masquerading itself was probably a UFO. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen <laughs> the movie Nope? Nope. I have not seen no. it yet. Is that, nope. Was that your response? Okay. Yeah, no, that kind of touches on that. Uh, and I love that camouflage uh, uh, mechanic that they supposedly use. And that, that movie touches on that a lot. It's like the whole, it's a big part of it. It's really, really great. I, I highly suggest watching it. It's a great movie. Well, a friend of mine, she used to be a park ranger on Haleakala. That's the big mountaintop here where the Space Force is now located. And she was there for about 15 years, and uh, she would tell us stories about, you know, because she lived on the land, too, when people, you know, uh, n not during tourist hours. And uh, 
And she said, uh, oh, yeah, we saw that. We saw spaceships. All right. And I, yeah, I can tell you <laughs> she had lots of interesting stories. So they're everywhere. You just have to look for them, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we also, I mentioned those, um, the the alien mummies and things. What's your take on those things that have been popping up everywhere? Or I guess they've been around for a while, but now they're just now the, being tested. A few, a the few one, of them the I looked like at and years. said right away, I don't believe this one, you know. Right. Um, you know, because I said it looks like uh, paper mache, you know, and or something like that. You know, there's a lot of disinformation out there as well. But there was my my guy who um, my Egyptologist I worked with for many years. He's a young guy. And he said during the Arab Spring uprising in uh, Cairo and Tahir Square, um, you know, he said they tried to save the uh, Cairo Museum from being looted. So a lot of the young Egyptologists formed a human link chain around the whole, you know, um, uh, uh, museum to stop anyone from coming in until the military came in and secured the building. So when the military came in, they weren't interested in any of the stuff on the first or the bottom floors or anything like they went to the top floor, the fourth floor, where no one's allowed. It's like a half floor. You wouldn't even know it existed. There's a, a doorway into it. And he says, that's where all the stuff that they can't catalog, the stuff that's really strange. And a number of years ago, somebody snuck a picture out of there and it looks like a human. It looks like a some type of alien mummy. And it was found in Dashur and it was buried with one of the pharaohs. And it, it, the, it had the name of the mummy was called Aseret. And it said loving counselor to the pharaoh. Huh. So we know they probably had some ET counselors back then too, you know. So, um, well, I think that's what people are doing is they're going back and looking at some of like this, the the art, and then seeing that like maybe that's what that is, you know. Like, well, who's this little dude? Is that your son? Nope, maybe yeah. that's one of them little Peruvian right. guys. Like, uh, right. so they've had like a handshake deal for a really long time, and I mean, if we're being honest, that would be like if you're trying to keep something really nonchalant, the best thing would be to just try to blend in. Uh, they probably already done the whole hybrid mating thing a long, long time ago. I, you know, like even the Sumerian culture, they're saying that they were having them mine gold and they were mating with the gods, like basically. Yeah, that's what I thought of when you were talking people. about that earlier when you said that there was a hybrid. That's I just think of yeah. that. But yes, there's, there's definitely hybrids. I mean, I when I lived in Santa Monica and I lived near 7th and Montana and I would go to the 7th Montana Starbucks when I was there. And every once in a while, this lady came in and I would turn to my friends and I said, she's an alien. And they'd go, well, how do you know? And I just said, she is an alien. Trust me. And then one day they saw her go over and empty a whole sugar packet in her mouth. And they Whoa. go, I guess you're right, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. mean, she had kind right. of bird stick legs. <laughs> so she looked like she may have come from some maybe the avian races or something like that. And there was just something about her auric field and everything else that the minute I saw her, I said, oh, she, that's alien. That's definitely alien. Does that and person know that? Though? <laughs> like if, if there are people that are alien, do they know that or they just think that they're like everybody else? I, I don't know. Well, you crazy know. people don't know they're crazy. <laughs> I just thought that was a good question because like yeah. people like say that like ah they're already here and they're among us and it's like and then you're like is, Probably it, not. is it me I don't know it could be, it could be. I only know what yeah. I am I don't know what anybody else is What's I mean I saw a lot of crazy people come into my therapy office you know and uh, I had I had some really unusual clients I had a lot of dissociative identity disorders you know that they had been you know that which was used to be called multiple personality disorders so I attracted a lot of unusual clients as well because I was open to hearing the bizarre and working with the bizarre and you know most most would would just send them over to the psychiatrist to get Thorazine or something, you know, where um, there's just so many things we just don't understand about our world, you know, and uh, um, some people don't have all their filters, scrub filters on, you know, they they're wide open and they're taking in like, you know, uh, radio free Europe practically. Uh, or, you know, the cosmos or something like that, where the rest of us, you know, we have enough of our scrubbers and filters on that we're not bombarded by all this other information out there. And now, you know, with uh, with all of these, um, you know, with the uh, uh, wireless communications and going from 4G mm -hmm. to in the future, mm -hmm. I saw it was like 6G or 7 or 8G, you know, like that. 10. Um, They're doing yeah, 10, 10 testing. 10. In where does, where does it end? Here, we're right just bombarded, bombarded.
Well, so think, those crazy people will probably be even more crazy in a number of years. <laughs> they have been testing 10G wireless internet in Westfield, Indiana, and that is the same frequency level that our brains actually like. Are, the electrical the electrical signals from our brains that emit our thoughts and can actually like be captured at, at that point in time, or like literally we're antennas that broadcast or receive energy or signals. But this new technology, like it literally went from penetrating uh, some walls to penetrating walls, to penetrating objects, to mm -hmm. penetrating solid objects. And that's 10G solid objects. So you, me, lead walls, everything, e absolutely everything. Nothing will really block its signals anymore. And waves travel outward everywhere. They actually have discovered something about black holes and the, the energy that swirls around the rings of them and then radiates around them that you can't really see. That's how they actually were able to take a picture of it was because of that radiating energy. And they used like all of the telescopes around the entire world working together to make this picture of the, the first black hole. Well, apparently that's that color that we're seeing is all the information that's ever been thought or spoken in the universe. Mm being captured around the ring of the black hole. There's a there's a movie or a series on Netflix called The Edge of All We Know that, that talks about that a little bit. It's uh, Stephen Hawking's team. Even though he's not going through really good times in the news right now, uh, but his team... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that worked on on that project um yeah they they did some astonishing uh work and and discovered some really awesome stuff that's not the way i thought you were going to go because like i we mentioned joel mentioned before like uh in a previous podcast because we talked to you know a lot of uh psychedelics as medicine and like dmt like you know uh people uh and the but the the fact that you know you were doing the talking to those types of patients and that those like you were saying the people that don't have those filters that that they were shamans in like yeah. previous worlds because they thought that's where you're going then you went that, off on that the was the kick. other they, they uh, were mostly very psychic individuals now they didn't you know they didn't have their shingles out or anything but because so many of them had been abused as children either sexually emotionally or physically um it it put them in a hyper alert status and when you're always in a hyper alert status as a child it develops psychic abilities it was been people at least don't realize that yep a couple people we've talked to that have had like uh most that have abilities to some degree they seem to have come and the story always starts with like some sort of abuse or isolation Right. I mean, I, you know, I could tell you stories about multiple personality that would, that would just blow you away. I mean, that, that, you know, one, one, you know, when diagnosed had all, all different types of cancer, when another one was out and you take tests, there was no signs of cancer, the other personalities. I mean, you know, it just defies wow. logic. That's, you know? <laughs> the mind is I had a client that was mind. like that and the doctor would just be scratching his head, retake the test. And then he go, I don't understand. <laughs> that's that's astonishing and, and like a testament to how powerful our, our like our thoughts really and our belief, our belief yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, in fact, she this one client, she had had probably about maybe eight different types of cancer over all her years. She's still alive, by the way, and she survived every every trial thing where everybody else died and she didn't. And the doctors were would actually get kind of pissed off because they couldn't understand why she survived all these. And she had repeated cancers. Over. But you know something? She was a prayer warrior. And she prayed away a lot of these cancers, you know. So she had a very powerful mind, whether you believe in prayer or not. You know, it worked for her. Well, prayer... Uh, I have to I have to go back to the the brainwaves thing. Um, there was a show uh, on the Innovation Network back in 2012 that I had watched that had a device that read the energy waves coming from the human brain, and they could see. Um, they asked someone to pray. They asked someone to think positively, and those waves registered the same. So, like if you're praying or you're thinking positively for somebody, it, it still generates the same sort of uh, energy force. Just think if we harnessed all that, all of us humans, and pictured the world how we want it to be, you know, and because we, we all just want peace and to have a good life and, and, you know, take care of our kids and everything else. We don't want all these wars and bankruptcy and the country going to hell and everything else like that. But if we put all that energy forward as a collective group, 
you know, wow. It'd be nice. Well, you know, there's no no, no such thing as a life that you're going to get a total free ride through it because then you don't learn anything. You tend to learn more under adversity, you know. So even even working with clients, you know, it's sort of like, well, some things aren't always going to work because maybe that's part of their karmic destiny to deal with that. And if I just kind of take it away right away or something like that, maybe I'm short circuiting them. So, you know, I always try to leave it to their, you know, their higher guidance. They, that's what it's there for. And, and you know. And, and you kind of do the best you can. Um, I'm I no longer I'm retired. I now I no longer practice that because I have plenty of other things to do, you know. But I did see some mighty strange. I saw some MK Ultra stuff, you know, uh, in my day too. And of course, those clients did not last long in in a clinical setting because if you got too close to the truth, they would have a scrambler personality built in there to uh, make them go back and report to their handler and uh, got, get reprogrammed. So, you know, those, the, they, Jeez. they don't last long in therapy. Yeah. What is it? Hey, would you say MK ultra? I don't think I know what that is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it was the CIA's mind programming thing. And what they did was that they would <clears throat> many years ago, they found that under um, abuse, children uh, broke off their personality dissociated. And if they could, they could intentionally try to do that by creating hidden child altar spies inside to carry information and their handler would then extract it. So this way, if anybody ever interrogated the kid, they wouldn't find out what the secret was unless you could bring forth that particular alter personality that they'd been programmed in to to carry that information. So my because I worked in in um Virginia Beach, Virginia when I was having these clients, that was home to the um the Atlantic fleet. So it was a lot of military bases. And I found that a lot of these came from uh families that uh, uh father was in military intelligence. So it was kind of mm -hmm. kept within the ranks. So um yeah, I didn't run into any of those when I practiced in California. It was only in um Virginia in uh, uh Virginia Beach. Yeah. Two shows that cover that Eric are Stranger Things and Jason Bourne, the Bourne, the Bourne. Oh I yeah, know. like yeah. Yeah. I mean it's the perfect spy, but to do it, you have to abuse the child to make them because the personality is developing up to the age of 7. And if they've been under constant, continual abuse by multiple caretakers and so forth, that's when they split off the personalities so that there isn't ego annihilation. You know, oh, it happened to that other part of me. So, you know, one part may take, uh, the, you know, the words that were said. Another part may take the smell. Another part might take something else, you know, so that it's, you know, oh, it happened. It happened to that one over there. It didn't happen to me. I'm, I'm still, you know, good girl and daddy still loves me or something like that. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, sometimes I just I just shake my head at how evil sometimes human nature can be, you know. I can't remember if you can look it up on their actual CIA website or not. You can look up many things like the gateway process and stuff like that on their actual website for the time being. Uh, which I highly suggest you if you have a computer and can go to the CIA.gov website and just look at stuff. It's really awesome. Yeah, they claim they're not. They don't do it any longer. But you know, do you believe anything your government tells you? <laughs> right. That's what they say about the alien thing. Is that like there's going to be a a big like they're they're like grooming us for it by like with with uh, media so we can get used to things and grooming us movies for sure. and like you know. Well, it's like Warner von Braun, you know, from the Nazi scientist that was brought over during Operation Paperclip. Paperclip. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, to to you know work. He was part of the beginnings of NASA. We just mined all their Nazi people and they brought over their ideology and everything else. And he said the last the last the threat will be of an alien invasion. And that's that's uh, so he warned people that that yeah. was the last. Yeah, that, that the last stunt that we try. Well, Operation what, Blue. Um, if you don't oh know, God. just make it up. Just make it up. If you don't Bluebird. know. Bluebird. Is it Bluebird? Blue, blue. Oh, my God. There's two. There's like Bluebird and Blue Book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What? <laughs> God, yeah. Oh, blue <laughs> beam from the other room. That's great. <laughs> Project Blue Beam was like blue the, beam. That's yeah, right. Blue beam. The, yes, the fake blue alien beam. invasion and, and uh, right. Jesus reincarnation gods. Yeah. Holograms like, in the sky, holograms. things like that. Yeah. In fact, 
in my library of truth, all information is kept in a holographic form that you can actually walk right into it and, and you know, um, not change it, but actually feel like you're there and living it. And I think that's where we're headed for all holographic information. Everything that we yeah. have yeah. now, we're like about 50 years behind what's actually in existence with our, you know, intelligence communities and everything else. You know, we're the last to get it, <laughs> the last to see it. Although they'll, 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 they'll bring it out when they think, you know, it's worth it, you know, to them. And but, it's just you know, us bringing it back because somebody watched Total Recall and thought that was pretty cool. I want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's waiting. And those technologies waiting in the wings, you know, like free energy and Tesla is like, you know, it's sort yeah. of like, but. Eh, probably not because then there's yeah. too many people would lose money on that one. And how do I make money off this? I can't. We'll bury it. Oh, I can we, put a car we have on to water. get rid of the people that need that money, and then we can do it. Yeah, you wonder half the people that uh, I had uh, um, a friend in in um, Santa Monica who claims her father said he was like the forefront uh, inventor of fiber optics, and I know damn well they got the fiber optics technology from oh, reverse yeah. engineering the alien craft. So what did he actually invent? You know. They, well, I always say that that when I leave this dimension, I'm not coming back to third dimensional Earth. In fact, I knew that uh, when I had my near death experience, and they wouldn't allow me to me go into the light because I found out later the light is a reincarnation trap, you know. And you go into that, and you keep coming back on third dimensional Earth all the time. And and they stopped me from going into that. And I was don't in the go tunnel. Into the light. Look behind don't you. Go into, don't go into the light. Don't and go said, into the light. And you know, and everybody goes, go towards the light, go towards the light. And now I'm hearing, no, no, don't go towards the light. And I said, well, well what does one do? And they said, um, because that's a trap, you'll see all the sh shiny, you know, uh, apparitions of mom and dad saying, come, Kathy, come, you know, or something like that. I love they this. Said, no. And they it's said, they said, they said, it's a trap. You'll keep coming back here and <laughs> over and over again. And they said, wait in the stillness of the void and your, your soul will know where to go. It will resonate and be led to the right place. Like a, a different, maybe a different dimension. Maybe you feel much more comfortable on a different dimension, this one. And you decided to come to this dimension during this great kind of evolutionary time to kind of, you know, eat your popcorn and see the, the, the fireworks going off. Um, I don't know, but I knew from way before I had a lot of these experiences that when I died this time around, that I was not coming back. So, well, I'm going to have to at this point go ahead and put in my vote for "Don't Go Into the Light" being the episode title. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> you know. And I said, well, you know, how come? Because I had all these new guides come into me, and I was paralyzed when I came back, and then they. They put me all back together, and then I became this physics geek, invented this stuff, and so forth like this. But I said, well, how come I didn't get the flowery, you know, sitting at the knee of Jesus thing and all the other stuff that, every, you know, you people talk about and the beautiful music and the flowers and so forth. And they go, and then, now this is not to cast aspersions on anybody who's had that, but they said, some people need more convincing than others. Yeah. So, so was it okay? Yep. I mean, we're kind of into it now, but so it was, you just, it was just the light and people guiding you in. Like, what what was that a whole experience then? Well, I was practicing in LA. This is back in two thousand three, yeah. and uh, my last client of the day was a Buddhist uh, nun, and she said, "Oh, tonight's the night of the Wesak Moon." This was in May. It usually happens first, like around the eighth or sixth or eighth or so of May. It's a little different each year, but. And I didn't know what a Wesak moon was. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, it's when the it's when the 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 dimensions are the thinnest. The veil between the dimensions are the thinnest, and almost anything can happen. And I kind of filed that away. Oh, that's that's nice. <laughs> you know. And you know, it was end of the it was evening and I was getting ready and I was going towards my car. And all of a sudden I feel this big whoosh of energy come right out of my solar plexus area. I mean, huge. And with it, immediately, I felt like um, I was done here with my work on Earth as I knew it. It was like all my best friends had left. You know, I felt empty, so empty. And not good empty, empty, empty. You know, like, I'm so lost, empty. And uh, I didn't know what that meant. And I thought, am I getting ready to die? And then I thought, but I'm not sick, you know, and I, I you know, it says, I, but what if I'm not getting ready to die and I have to feel this for the rest of my life? This is not going to be good. So I went home and I'm drinking some tea and I'm sitting on my couch thinking about this, and analyzing because I was going to my analytic mode. Next thing I see is I'm sucked into this swirling vortex into this tunnel and I'm traveling horizontal 
of, uh, you know, feet first, tri- traveling really fast, and I could see light at the end of this tunnel. And immediately I thought, oh, my God, is this the tunnel everybody's been talking about? And if so, did I just die? What did I die of? I wasn't sick. And then I realized, well, if I die, there's not much I can do about it. So let's go see what this is all about. But right before uh, I I came to a dead stop, excuse the pun, came to a stop right (laughs) right in front of the tunnel, I mean, in front of the light. And I could not get into that light. And I wanted to go into that light. That was before I knew it was a trap, you know. And um, and I tried to wheel myself in and nothing worked. And I I thought I had this thought, this irreverent thought that, oh, this is boring, you know. And with the thought, this is boring, all of this energy poured back into me. And I mean, it was like, wow, it just rocked my socks and spun me back around and sent me back through the tunnel as fast as could be. I found myself back in my physical body and my whole left side was paralyzed. And I heard voices in my head saying, breathe, Kathy, breathe. And I realized I just was an all knowing that some, for some reason my heart had stopped and these voices were trying to get me to breathe back life into my physical form. And since I couldn't move, I was paralyzed on my left side. You know, I listened to them and they just kept saying, relax, relax, everything's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And I could hear clicking in my head as all parts of my my body came back into uh, alignment and I could feel them again. You know, these loud clicks, which I don't really understand what that was. But um, And then um, I remember feeling a heaviness, a little pressure in my chest and I thought, oh, I'm going to need to go see a cardiologist. And they said, no, you're okay. You don't need to see a cardiologist. It wasn't until years later when I when I actually did get COVID that I went to see a cardiologist just to make sure. And he said to me, he said, I can't understand why there's a scarring on the left side of your heart. Now, I hadn't told him anything that had happened to me. And of course, I didn't tell him then, you know, uh, but there was the proof of it right there all those years later. But anyway, so I, I go into work the next day and I'm feeling everybody's emotions. And I know they're not mine, you know, but I'm feeling and I became was super sensitive. And at night, I every night I would be getting up between three and four a.m. in the morning and all these quantum you know, energetic ener- energy things were going through my head. It was I was going, was, and I couldn't sleep until I got up on my computer and researched it. And the voices in my head were saying, "Well, this is correct. This is not correct." But that's as far as your race's understanding has gotten so far. And this would go on night after night. And I finally called a friend of mine, and this friend, he's uh, he's a w- pretty well known in his field. I'm not going to mention his name here because it'll probably be deluge then. Um, <laughs> and he had worked with me. He's a, a timeline reader and a very gifted medical intuitive. I mean, the CIA even wanted to work with him at one point in time, and he said no. And uh, just with the person's name and their permission, he could go behind the scenes and look and see what was happening with them from a soul perspective. So I just called him and I said, uh, can you take a look and see what's going on with me? I didn't tell him anything. And uh, because he never wanted to know anything about the person. And he goes, well, Kathy, you almost died. He said, but the strange thing is all your old guidance left. That was that whoosh feeling out of the solar plexus. He said, you have a whole new set of guides. He said, they're kind of technologically oriented, almost kind of geeky. And I'm thinking, uh, maybe that's why I'm, you know, getting up and researching all these things at night. And he said, he said, uh, I said, well, what do they want? And he said, well, they're showing me that they sent you back. He said, it looks like a soul contract. He said, but they sent you back because you're, you're, you're supposed to invent some type of medical device. And, and I said, oh, I don't know anything about inventing or anything like that. And he goes, no, they're showing me they'll, they'll lead you to the right, the, the right people to work with you on this. And, and then I remember thinking, oh, well, he's finally wrong, you know? And, uh, but I couldn't let go of it. I just, it was like this magnificent obsession, you know? And so I, you know, I, I, at, I started to, you know, seek out, you know, quantum based inventors. And every time I did the, excuse the expression, the shit would hit the fan <laughs> and obstacles like anything. And I, I asked them, well, I don't understand. They said, we don't want them to do it. We want you to do it. You know, all this information, you've done it before in the past. I assume past lives. And uh, he said, so, you know, it's just going to, it's, uh, and and so when I finally agreed, succumbed, you know, and said, okay, you know, then I started getting these downloads. I'd hear, see pictures in my head. I'd, I'd hear them talk with, to me. I'd get whole concepts down. And it led to inventing, because uh, they were trying to teach me that uh, everything in the universe had a mathematical signature to it. Even our DNA mm-hmm. was mathematically coded. And this was back in 2003. 
and uh, that you needed to speak to it a language it understood, which is math, and that this device would be to stream mathematical information algorithms to the body so that they could use it just as if they, like, mathematical algorithm for vitamin C. Instead of taking vitamin C, you can stream the mathematical algorithm to the body using, um, I won't go into the whole device. If anybody wanted to really see it, they can go to my website, trinfinity8.com, or just Google my name and it'll, it'll show up. The, we'll and, we'll and get all so, your links around this. Yeah, so we got what it. What we yeah. say is like, wherever yeah, you're listening, works. look around, There's but there'll be buttons to push that will take you to these. So I invented a software that deals with, uh, with uh, emotional release stuff, physical problems, anti-aging. I always put in, you know, nobody believes it because i'm 71 years old and never had any work done and you know energy it's all energy and it can make you young if you stream it and work with it in the right way and then i went on to invent um uh the ascension 11 it's uh it's a spiritual program and these are all based on uh computer-based program software programs that stream algorithms through a digital signal box into uh, wires that uh, you attach to pure quartz crystal rods that are made in a lab specially for this, and they stream it to the body, and you can use those quartz crystals anywhere on your body for the information to come through to. So it's all over the world now. So it's, you know, it's not what I plan to do with my life, but, you know, that's kind of what happened. And it's uh, um, it's used by uh, doctors too, you know, as an add-on tool. I had one guy in Beverly Hills using it to speed up, uh, um, you know, when he was doing reconstructive facial, you know, facelifts and so forth, uh, tissue repair and whatnot. So, um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it does a lot of different things. So yeah, I've, I've let a I thought my life was going to be ordinary. <laughs> Why was I wrong? Was was the ND like the beginning of all this stuff? Like that's just where like you didn't have as much interest in these things before. Like, I mean, I had a passing interest in it, but yeah. um, the, the the kicker was that you know even though I have a PhD in clinical psychology, math was my worst subject in school. And so when they're telling me everything is mathematical based, I said, this, is, this has got to be some kind of cosmic joke, right? You know, why are you giving it to me? I struggled through math. I, I did great on all the other subjects, but for some reason, I was not wired that way for math, you know? And then I found out later, it, it actually helped being a math dummy <laughs> because I didn't have any preconceptions, you know? And I just kind of went with the instruction they were that that they were showing me and so forth like that and put it all together. And uh, uh, they led me to uh, display it. Um, it took five years to develop this thing. I didn't tell a lot of my friends what was going on because I felt like they'd think, oh, poor Kathy, she's lost her mind. Um, and so I kept it kind of under wraps, except for my family. And uh, I was led to uh, display it at uh, an International Society for Subtle Energy Medicines in Denver. And uh, I had a number of laptops I put out with, you know, with, with all the hardware attachments to it. And I just invited people to try it free, you know, just give me feedback because I didn't know what, what these things, what it would do. And before I knew it, I had a line at my booth and uh, these people could see energy. I mean, they could see it around you. I mean, they were, they, they, most of them were very psychic and they were telling me, oh, this is what I'm seeing with this particular one. It's running on this particular uh, program and this one and so forth like that. But the kicker was this, there was this one guy, he was an ophthalmologist uh, from Northern California and also a, a psychic, gifted psychic. And he came off the device and he was crying. And I thought, oh, God, oh, he's had a bad experience or something. What happened? And he says, oh, no, no, this wasn't. He said, uh, he said, all my guides came forward and recognized this technology right away. In fact, he said, I didn't think I'd see it in this lifetime. It's this is very this is Atlantean technology just packaged differently. And he said, uh, he said they were using it to fine tune my psychic abilities, like, like a, on a radio channel, trying to get in the right, you know, the right station. And he said they knew exactly what it was for. And he said, and then I saw all these beings of light. This is the guides, new guides that I came back with. Um, he said behind this device. And I mean, I knew that they were eighth dimensional beings, you know, but, um, but he said, but then this man came forward. And he identified himself as your father, and he just wanted you to know that it was money well spent. And this guy knew nothing about me, and two months after I had my near-death experience, my father died. And my mother died a year later after that, and they left me money so that I could develop it. 
you know, and uh, so it would have been something my father would have said, money well spent. And of course, I started crying immediately, <laughs> you know, because I was like, oh, my God. But um, and then it just took off. It was it's, you know, all over the world. It's a niche market. You know, it's uh, it's it's a very unconventional um, alternative healing device, Trinfinity 8 and Ascension 11. So, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so after that, like I said, then I got into sci fi and 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 Egypt stuff. And and uh, so I have this immense curiosity. I can't rest. You know, it's sort of like I have to sop up everything I can understand. And so that's kind of what my life is journey has been like. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, all that lies, it could, kind of like, draws to like the big question that we, we usually have uh, after we've talked for a little bit, it's uh, after all these experiences, and especially since you, you know, you had an NDE and like you experienced all these things, like in the end, like what do you think we're here for? And, and what do you think happens? Like when we're, when we're gone? Um, well, I th I think as souls, we experience lots of different dimensions, different planes of existence, different planets, if you may, you know, and so forth. And But I think that, you know, uh, third dimensional Earth is where humans actually come into form. The first two dimensions are non-human dimensional, you know, not, not until you get to the third dimension. And on third dimension, you experience um, creativity, energy into matter, you experience emotions, you experience a lot of things that maybe you don't get to maybe um, quite the same way on other different dimensions. So that's why this is such a, a magnet ground, you know, that people, uh, we go do our learning here on third dimensional earth, you know, um, after this, most of us will probably go to fifth dimensional Terra, which, you know, all those, all those technology you see now, nobody's going to be using cell phones, they're already incorporated in our mind, and we can do it naturally, you know, um, you know, so, uh, um, but everything is about learning and growing and evolving. And, you know, as souls, we, you know, we broke apart from source at one time and we all wanted to have our own experiences that we could bring co collectively back to source again. And that's the journey. You know, it's sort of like uh, those Russian nesting dolls, a doll within a doll within a doll. There's 12 dimensions and all those dimensions are parked within each other dimension, like, like those Russian nesting dolls. So um, it's a fractal universe. So, what was the the Terra? What was that again? The fifth fifth dimensional Terra. What was that? There, fifth dimensional Terra. T e r r a. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's. Uh, um, I address that in actually one of my books, uh, my second book. You know, uh, no, my excuse me, my third book, and uh, you know, going to fifth uh, because the Library of Truth is is an eighth dimensional thing. It's not in fifth dimension. It's much. It's but but a lot of souls will after they've been here and i i think that's why maybe it, it, we're having such a hard time right now some of the old souls who have been reincarnating here over and over again you know it's sort of like it's time for them to move on they some of them gotten kind of complacent but looking around they're starting to say you know this isn't really doesn't quite feel comfortable anymore here you know um because what what used to be uh covert is now overt and you know what was used to be justice is now injustice or whatever you know it's sort of like they're seeing the other side of it and it's always been there it's just been hidden and now it's in plain sight and i think it's a little too much for some of the older souls some of the younger souls you know this is their time to learn all that stuff and i think that's that's why they're sticking around more now and you can tell who some and i don't mean you know 18 year olds or or teenagers i mean some who who um, may haven't experienced a lot of incarnations into third dimensional earth are 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 getting that now and you can tell they're you know they, they may be going more towards service to to self than service to others and attracted more to the little bling over here or the corruption or the 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 sex or the drugs or anything else because they're still experimenting where some of us who've probably been here a lot longer have said you know i've been down that road already it's not what i want yeah, and then that you said the choice is the light, or and then not the light turns into just uh, something else. Like, what is that? Yeah, um, you know, people are afraid of the void, and actually, the void is teeming with life, you know, and and potential, you know, and so to to still take take a minute to be still in the black darkness of the void. And then you'll be led to where you really need to go. But some people, their soul, their higher soul may step in and say, you know, you may need a couple more reincarnations back on, on Earth. 
you know, um, because there's some lessons you really haven't quite gotten down pat yet. So <laughs> it's different for everybody. It's interesting, like the different people we talk to and the different views, and they all end up kind of saying very similar things with just different flavors. So that's why it's like yeah, there's many routes to the same end. Yeah. Well, when you keep an open mind, you're you're going to learn. I say, don't you know, your mind shouldn't be so open that your brain falls out. But but you know, it's 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 good to. I mean, that's that's why I was challenged with so many unusual clients. The fact is that their reality may be different than my reality, and trying to understand the reality, but not nullifying their reality because everybody experiences reality different. I have one question to ask you before this is all done so here here's just a little theory i wonder how you feel about this so let's say that there is a number there's like a a total number of souls that existed before they decided to make earth like uh to put us in flesh suits and so like we go into our flesh suits, we die, we get buried in the ground, and then our soul goes back, and then we're like waiting for our next target. Like, who will I be in my next life? Who will I do I get to choose my difficulty level? Like, can I make my life really hard and just deal with a lot of problems and get through it? Um, you know, well, some people talk about that, you know, uh, time is nonlinear. You know, and everything is happening past, present, and future at the same time. And that on the wheels of karmic reincarnation, perhaps our soul is, um, is splitting off and there are other Cathy's on third dimensional earth right now experiencing other things. You know, just like there might be other Cathy's in the Egyptian lifetime right now or the Atlantean lifetime. And if it's all simultaneous, and that's why maybe the, the the thought of deja vu or things that are bleeding through, you know, um, I don't have the definitive answer on that. But, you know, it's, it certainly is uh, thought provoking. Joel, you may be more suited to another dimension. I mean, well, maybe you had more lifetimes there and you came down, uh, you know, sort of like so they, they joke that a lot of us, you know, got lottery tickets to watch that this time. It's it's a it's a peak evolutionary time for man that what we're going through right now in like the next you know maybe 100 years or so forth like that yeah and, and so forth and so you know some of us are are watching you know detached with our popcorn and going oh man they're really crazy you know and others are just getting just wrapped up into the fear of it and going insane because they feel powerless and you know and others are going oh let's get out of here <laughs> maybe and then some you know i i'm of the belief that at least i was shown that when we come into this lifetime, we can decide how much energy we take with us in our soul body. A lot of times we don't take 100% of our soul body. And I think some people misjudge how much energy they need in the lifetime. They may have a more difficult lifetime and they may get sick more often mm. because they misjudge their energy allotment, you know? Well, I, I really appreciate you. I had no idea like where we we're going to go with this because there's so many things to cover. I really appreciate you, you talking with us today. And I'm pretty sure we probably have a million things to cover. So you have to come back and talk to us again. Right. How, many, how many different <laughs> links do we have to share? Cause I feel like I don't even like we, and you probably uh, have one link. Three links. There's three links. There's a uh, trinfinity com, And then there's ascension 11.com. And then there's stacks library of truth.com. And yeah. there's links to all my books there and on Amazon and so forth like that. And it's available. Uh, the books are all my books, uh, not just uh, in my books on on my near death experience too. They're all available in print and Kindle and Audible. So on Amazon, uh, like and subscribe if you're if you're into this. And you know, a lot of it it's it's about like uh, the near death experience and stuff. And like the fact that we just went went way deep on the aliens in Egypt thing was was cool because I didn't I didn't know where you wanted to go with it and like it's two of my favorite subjects. Yeah, so. I, I really <laughs> like wanted to talk about those things. I didn't know but I also didn't know like how how deep you were with all that. So that, that made it even cooler. Yeah. Oh well, you can ask I mean like I said I've heard everything in my career. And you know I'm I you get tired of talking about your near death it gets down to sound bites after a while. But you know all this other stuff I mean I just love you know and I and you know I like I said I've been on artificial uh uh, not artificial alien uh, digs in New Mexico and so forth like that. So yeah, I'll come back sometime. But thanks, guys, for inviting me. As I say in in in, in uh, Maui, mahalo. Well, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks, take care. Thank Bye. you much. Bye.